Although I might, because I'm from, I'm from the South West, I might go U.R. or something like that as we go through. But we'll see. I'll try to keep it, um, I'll try to keep it normal. Okay. So what are we going to look at? So we're going to look at um, withdrawal of ventilation in motor neuron disease, including some of the legal aspects, some of the ethical aspects, and then some of the practical ex um, aspects. Okay. So as been pointed out already, saying, um, motor neuron disease is a progressive neuromuscular disease that attacks the upper and lower motor neurons. Respiratory muscle weakness will happen in all patients and eventually in just about all patients will cause their death, some form of respiratory complication. We know that non-invasive ventilation will improve length of life in patients who've got non-bulbar motor neuron disease. In patients with bulbar motor neuron disease, actually there's much less evidence. In fact, I can't think of any evidence which suggests to me that these patients will live longer if they've got severe bulbar onset motor neuron disease with NIV. And we know that weak cough management is pivotal, pivotal in these patients to increase their length of life and reduce morbidity, but also to make the patient feel more comfortable. But that's all based on expert opinion, as, as you were saying, rather than um, RCT stuff. Okay, so assisted ventilation and life support ventilation is a medical treatment that can improve the quality of life, improve symptoms and improve survival in selected patients. But patients do, do not have to consent to that. And at any time during their disease process, they can say, I no longer want this ther therapy. Okay? Even if they know it's going to kill them. But discontinued ventilation appears to generate far more concerns amongst healthcare professionals and lay, profession um, lay people than maybe withdrawing of dialysis or stopping chemotherapy for, um, for a, a cancer of some description, or withdrawing IV fluids at the end of life. I'll talk about that as we go through and why that might be. But in essence, if a patient has capacity and wants to stop ventilation, and stopping that ventilation will cause them to die, it's completely acceptable, it's completely legal, and I think ethically it is the right thing for us to do, and we'll be exploring some of these issues as we go through. But in reality, for many people, including, in my experience, some very experienced, some very senior clinicians, including some people high up organisations. It is confusing, difficult and concerning. And some people feel it's euthanasia. But we'll talk about some of that as we go through. Let's take a closer look then. So we've got some evidence on this now. We've got some um, studies which I was involved with, which looked at professionals and family experience of withdrawing ventilation in patients with MND. We know that professionals have said that providing the care for a ventilator-dependent patient who has asked for assisted ventilation to be withdrawn is practically and emotionally very challenging. Of course it's going to be. That's understandable. Although the ethics and legality are in theory very clear, in practice many professionals felt, and I think to a lesser extent, but still feel very uncertain about these aspects of managing patients, withdrawing a life support machine and the patient dies. And families have recounted in, the, in this study how care, while the withdrawal process was happening, how we failed patients during the withdrawal process. You're all aware of these, I'm sure. These are the four ethical principles of medicine. They're widely used and sometimes reasonably criticised. But the four main ones I'm going to talk about today in particular is autonomy, beneficence, that's doing good for the patient, non-maleficence, which is doing no net harm to the patient, and justice, which I'm not going to talk about too much. So I'm going to talk mainly about these, um, these three. And to illustrate this, I wanted to talk about David. David was one of my patients who was diagnosed with motor neuron disease when he was just about to finish his PhD at the age of 23. He started an IV at 25 and was tracheostomy ventilated. He chose to have tracheostomy ventilation for a variety of reasons, which I don't need to go into now, um, when he was 26. After one year on total life support ventilation, he felt that his quality of life was no longer acceptable to him and he asked for his ventilation to be stopped, which we did and he died very quickly. How do people feel? Can I have a show of hands about how people feel about that? Is that okay to be doing that? Just, you know, yeah? Good. There's lots of nods. Now, if I'd have done this talk three or four years ago, there'd have been lots more apprehension in the room. So that's great. So that's good. We'll talk a bit more about David as we go through, I think. So in terms of autonomy, and the autonomy is the main thing that's going to trump anything else ethically, really. 
As long as patients have the capacity to make his or her own decisions relating to medical care, they should have the autonomy to make those decisions. Okay? Now, I know this is based on the Mental Capacity Act, in, which was introduced in 2005 in England and Wales. I think that's just been a, a similar thing just come through in Northern Ireland, although it's not necessarily law yet, is it? But it's, it's, it's gone through, I think, the Mental Capacity Act of 2016. They're very, very similar. Um, and in there, it's quite clear that unwise, eccentric or odd decisions are appropriate and are allowed. So even if we as professionals feel that someone's making an odd decision, suddenly wanting to die, that's OK, as long as they've got the capacity to make the decision. But to have the capacity, individuals must be given the help and information they need to make those decisions. And that's really important. We're going to talk a bit more about that as we go through. Advanced decisions to re refuse treatment should be encouraged in these patients. And I'm really looking forward to this talk this afternoon because my experience is a lot of patients who ain't asked for tracheostomy ventilation find it really difficult to make advanced decisions. And we get diff into difficulties as, we, as the disease progresses and the patient's less able to communicate. But again, we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. OK, so ventilation then is a treatment and can be declined. And of course, David has the right to say, I no longer want ventilation, even if this is going to cause my death. But some people are a little bit concerned that this is suicide because he's taking his own life to a certain extent, potentially. And other people would say, well, if I turn off the ventilator, aren't I the person who's euthanizing the patient? OK, so let's look at suicide to start with. Suicide is the action of killing oneself intentionally. Ventilation that the patients receive for however long it is, and some patients with tracheostomy ventilation live for many years. So I've got patients who've lived with tracheostomy ventilation for 10 years with motor neuron disease, and they feel their quality of life is still acceptable. Professor Stephen Hawkins had tracheostomy ventilation for goodness knows how long. The ventilation has prevented death from the motor neuron disease and prolonged life. Stopping the ventilation is merely re-establishing the chain of causa causality. So I'll show you a bit more, but I've got a slide on that in a minute. But what we're saying is it's the motor neuron disease that's causing his death, not the fact that we're taking him off the ventilator. He would have died a lot sooner without the ventilation. So what about euthanasia? At this side, I don't know what happened here. They were exactly the same thing. Sorry about that. Um, but euthanasia is the painless killing of a patient suffering from an incurable and painful disease or an ir irreversible coma. Again, stopping ventilation is merely re-establishing the, the chain of caus causality. It isn't designed an in action designed to cause death. So that's what euthanasia is. So David obviously isn't being euthanized. He's, having, he's got MND. That's what's causing his death. So this is a slide which sort of quite nicely shows the chain of causality. If I move away from the microphone, can everyone hear me, by the way? Because I am tend to be someone who wants to do this when I'm talking, sorry. So we'll say here there's a catastrophe. Now, in this case, this is being diagnosed and getting motor neuron disease. Okay? The level of the patient's functioning from the motor neuron perspective and from the respiratory perspective decreases. And here the patient develops respiratory failure. If we don't intervene with some sort of treatment for the respiratory failure, the patient will die. But if we do interfere, actually the level of functioning can improve a bit, the quality of life is maintained, but eventually the patient gets worse. If the patient decides they don't want the treatment anymore, then they'll die. So you can see that the patient isn't dying because we're ceasing the intervention, they're dying because of this disease which will have killed them back here anyway. Okay? So this is completely acceptable, it's completely legal, and it's completely ethical. Interestingly, when we talk about ventilator dependence, I'm sorry this isn't a brilliant slide because the only way I could do it was take a photograph and, of, and uh, put it on my, uh, just email it to myself. But this is um, some audit of um, tracheostomy, sorry, ventilation withdrawal in patients with motor neuron disease and, some and one spinal injury patient. And all these patients were dependent on non-invasive ventilation. And you can see, although these patients were dependent on non-invasive ventilation, when we remove the ventilator, We'll talk a bit more about this audit in a minute. Some patients die very quickly, but actually, this patient here, who funnily enough had a spinal cord injury, um, he was one of my patients who actually been ventilated invasively for five years, and he, we were convinced he was ventilator dependent. He never had a, barely a second off the ventilator in five years. When we disconnected him from the ventilator, he took 24 hours to die. So although these patients are ventilator dependent, often removing the ventilator isn't going to cause their sudden death, even though we sometimes think it's going to be. So, 
if you've got capacity, you can make the decision at any time to say, I want to with withdraw this life prolonging treatment. But we know that in motor neuron disease, we frequently get um, problems with communication because of bulbar weakness and facial um, muscle weakness, which makes it very difficult to communicate verbally or non-verbally. Um, Non-invasive ventilation and tracheostomy ventilation both interfere with being able to communicate. If you've got a mask on your face blowing air in, you're not able to communicate so well, you're not able to hit, um, make yourself heard so well. And if you've got tracheostomy ventilation, and I would argue if you've got tracheostomy ventilation for motor neuron disease, you'd always have a cuff tube in to protect your airway, then you're not going to be able to communicate verbally at all. Now, eye movements are protected in most patients with motor neuron disease, nearly all patients. But actually, my experience is that some patients with tracheostomy ventilation lose that ability to use their eye movement particularly well. Now, that might be because they're just so tired. They're just unable to, unable to use their eyes. They're unable to concentrate for long periods. And on top of that, around about 15%, but I think Colette said around about 30% of patients this morning have some form of associated temporal dementia. So you add those three factors together and actually your ability to communicate desires, concerns and consent to treatment um, or you lose capacity happens in these patients with tracheostomy ventilation or in patients who are mass ventilated for 24 hours a day. And some patients with tracheostomy ventilation and MD can become locked in. So how do we manage those situations? Well, we hope that any patient who is or becoming ventilator dependent will have in place an ADRT. In my experience, that's easier said than done in some patients. Some patients are really keen to have them. Other patients, my experience tells me, there's no way they're going down the route of having an ADRT. They don't want to talk about death. Is that the reason they've chose to have tracheostomy ventilation, to keep them alive as long as possible? Because I don't know. But certainly, I found that really difficult. And we're just in a situation at the minute where we've got a man who's just about lost capacity on tracheostomy ventilation. Um, and he, I've been talking to him about advanced directives for years. Um, he never wanted one. And he's now in a situation where he can barely communicate. He can just about say yes with his eyes once. Um, so it's making life really quite difficult there. Nor does he have a lasting power of attorney. Now, his wife said, well, I'm his lasting power of attorney. I can make decisions on his behalf. But actually, when we looked at the paperwork, she had the lasting power of attorney for finance and property. She didn't have a lasting power of attorney for health and well-being. So she can't make any decisions about his care. She can be involved in the decision-making process. And of course, we want her to be involved in the decision-making process. But without that lasting power of attorney for health and well-being, unfortunately, she's not able to make decisions on the patient's behalf. But if you've got an ADRT that's saying, I want to withdraw ventilation when I can no longer communicate, or your lasting power of attorney agrees that's the case, then it would be legal and appropriate to stop ventilation. But in the absence of either an advanced directive or a lasting power of attorney, the situation gets really, really tricky. Under the Mental Capacity Act, we can work in the best interest of the patient. Is it in their best interest in terms of this beneficent, non-maleficent situation? to be extending the patient's life when they're not able to communicate whether they consent to treatment or whether they've got a good quality of life anymore. So we need to have a best interest decision and often it's appropriate to get legal advice in these cases. I'm not sure we've, uh, there's been one that's gone to court in the UK, it's all been managed on best interest, but I think it's appropriate to be involving the legal side of things in these patients, particularly if the family are completely anti to what you're doing. So how do we do it? Okay, so I was part of, I was lucky enough to be part of the um, Association for Palliative Medicine work on um, withdrawal of ventilations in, in patients with motor neuron disease. This is easily accessible on the internet, and I think it's a 64 page document. Is it going to work? Probably not, <laughs> judging by that little spinny thing. But you can all access this. If you just um, Google Withdrawal of Assisted Ventilation Association of Palliative Medicine, the, um, it comes up very nicely. And that gives you a very detailed um, document telling you exactly how you can manage these situations. But I'm just going to pick some key points from that. Now, I bet I won't be able to move the slide on now because I've destroyed the IT. I might need some help here, IT person. Sorry. Because I often do this. <laughs> I'll be all right now. Look, all you've got to do is look at it. Oh, no. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right. So the first thing to do is decide, 
is this legal? Are we doing, is this process of withdrawal legal? So patient with capacity, they must obviously be making an informed choice. So we need to be giving them the information to be able to make this decision. They should have at least two conversations with two different professionals, one of whom should be a senior doctor. For the patient who has lost capacity, they must have a valid ADRT or a lasting power of attorney for health and well-being. And there should also be a best interest meeting with the family and the, sorry, this is somebody who's lost capacity, so with the family and professionals. For a patient who has lost capacity and does not have a valid ADRT or an LA, uh, lasting power of attorney, then we need a best interest meeting and probably some legal representation, particularly if there's a divergent view between um, the family and, and the medical professionals. Okay, communication is key to this. And it's important from the outset of setting patients up on non-invasive ventilation that they know that at any stage during their disease process, they can withdraw from that ventilation or tell us they no longer want it. Okay. I've had experiences of patients either not picking up on the fact that they can stop ventilation early on or that they might become dependent on non-invasive ventilation later on, who've actually said to me, or the family have said to me after the patient's died, if we'd have known that this was going to happen, we wouldn't have embarked on non-invasive ventilation. And my experience is that if you give patients an informed choice initially whether they want to start invasive ventilation and not every patient does, that's fantastic. I think it really helps giving patients the choice. So our practice is that we, you know, we look at the respiratory function of the patient, we look at the patient's symptoms, and we say to the patient, this might improve your situation. It may make you live a bit longer, but the disease will progress. If they've got bulbar disease, it may help with their symptoms, but it isn't going to help them live any longer. And then we'll let the patient make their own decision. So we've got to get that started and correct from the outset of non-invasive ventilation. Once we've Establish that the patient wants non-invasive ventilation, it's really, really important, and I'm saying this again, that the patient is aware at any stage they can stop it, because actually patients don't like to uh, disappoint us as healthcare professionals, so they feel that, or their relatives, um, they feel they should continue it for whatever reason, um, even if they don't want to. And that communication is important with the family as well from the outset. Now, in terms of withdrawing ventilation, of course, you've got to communicate with the patient and their family. Okay, to make sure the decision's legal and is what the patient wants. But we've also got to communicate with the, within the team because there's still a lot of professionals out there who have real misgivings about withdrawing ventilation in patients who are ventilator dependent, so they're on life support ventilation. Still huge amounts of people. And the evidence um, that there is shows us that you know, people are really concerned about doing this. <coughs> 